Good morning. It's Prairie Oaks, but not the same as it usually is. Those of you who normally listen to the podcast know that you've heard me say it before, that there's no substitute for coming together with our church family, with the fellowship, the kids running in, the affection from our senior saints, and just the singing and prayers. and It's what we love. But this is the only part that can be easily recorded and sent to you. So, here we go. This too shall pass. We look forward to coming together again. But in the meantime, we're going to look into scriptures together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just as I promised in the previous video. We're going to look at the whole chapter, but for right now we're going to read from verses 1 through 8 and verse 11. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8 and verse 11. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. The Lord knows we need all the prayers we can get, and we always need more practice. Let's pause for prayer. Father, just thankful you've given us this time together. I thank you, Lord, that we have the technology to be able to do these things. Uh, it's no substitute for the real thing, Lord, of your people with your Holy Spirit dwelling within us to come together to to share and fellowship and just uh, to feel your love. But Lord, as we do this, your love still is the same. Your promises still remain. And so Lord, as we make the effort to call one another and to uh, meet by these technological means, Lord, that we take them seriously, but also, Lord, that we just feel your presence and that we, uh, what we have in you, become a source of strength to share with others, Lord, because we know and we can see a lot of people who are struggling to find hope to find meaning, Lord. And you are our hope. You are our meaning. And so, Lord, we pray for the folks that are suffering and struggling, both mentally and physically. We pray, Lord, for your servants as first responders and, and medical technicians and, and doctors and nurses and, and, Lord, those that serve us uh, in the pharmacies and grocery stores and and just not able to to stop, Lord, and to hunker down, that you just give a special grace to them, Lord. We pray for uh, those around the world that are suffering greater uh, from this, Lord, and that uh, help us to be compassionate and to be your hands and feet, Lord as you give us ability, Lord, to be wise stewards of what we have here. We love you and we need you. Forgive us of the times that we doubt you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, the true King and the great physician, we pray. Amen. Okay, so last time I shared a little bit about how we have this confidence in the testimony of the Apostle Paul and these others that he named as eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is more than just 
an intellectual assent to a fact that took place. This fact has truth anchored to it that is essential for us to remember, especially in times when we are tempted to doubt, tempted to fear, tempted to, to want to hide. And so that's where we want to go with this this morning is the Apostle Paul gives us some points here. He wants us to remember from 1 Corinthians 15 to these believers in this uh, Greek city who are being tempted for a number of reasons to forget the significance that Jesus rose from the dead. And so first off, he wants to remind them, don't forget don't forget, this is what I preached to you. This is what you received. You sat and listened to this. But also that you chose to believe this. They looked at the facts and they knew this was true. And not only is it what you received, it's in which you stand. This is our firm foundation. Our firm foundation is on the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it confirms everything else. Everything that he taught, everything that he practiced, everything that he is confirmed by the resurrection. And by extension then, the word of God is confirmed by this resurrection fact. This is not a fad. This is not something that's fading. It's not something we should take flippantly. It is a fact that is truth. It is a, the main thing. And the main things are the plain things. And so don't forget, unless you believed in vain, this is our anchor. This is our solid foundation. This resurrection. But there's something else that's significant in how he teaches this. He says, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. He was he's practicing what he preaches. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was according to the plan. According to the scriptures. So he wasn't one that he heard about it by word of mouth. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus, resurrected from the grave, years after the resurrection had taken place and the ascension into heaven. No, what he's referring to here is the Hebrew scriptures. And that is significant because they were written centuries, if not millennia, before Christ walked the earth, which implies that, which emphatically teaches that God had a unified plan all the way through, revealed it through his prophets, and that the life, death, and resurrection, ascension of Jesus, carefully planned events, foreordained before creation began. That's huge. That's huge. A lot of you who've heard me preach before know that you know, God working on plan A is one of the things that I marvel at because our plans change. Our, our, our circumstances right now are reinforcing that we are not very good at knowing what is next and we're not always sure what to do right now, much less what to be doing a week later, a month later. We don't know. Nothing has taken God by surprise. It is all proceeding as planned. The central plan of God from the beginning. It looked like in the circumstances of as you walked with Jesus, as the enemies were against him, his own people opposed to him. One of his disciples betrayed him. All of them denied him. It looked like it was out of control. What could be done? Was God had his hands off the wheel? It seems so counterintuitive to think that this was part of the plan. And now the apostles, 
after the fact look back and say, oh, it all makes sense now. Now I understand. In fact, Peter was the one who said, this was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. It was foretold. And the enemies of God couldn't do anything to stop it from happening, but fell right into their roles in the plan to see that the sinless lamb of God would be sacrificed for our sins. It's unfolding to further the glory and the glory of God and the good of us. And here's the thing. If that's true of his life and everything is connected as we can plainly see, then it's also true of our lives. Our days are numbered in his book. He knows our lives are precious to him. Our tears are treasured, we are told by the psalmist. If the sparrows are carefully guarded by the father, how much more so are his children carefully guarded? And so we have a daring confidence that each day we have is a gift ordained from the beginning, and God has this under control. And so I want to pause for a second here just to kind of write a few of these down here so that we remember. So one, Paul is saying, don't forget. And then we see that we have a daring confidence, a daring confidence confidence that comes from knowing God has the plan and he's got it under control. But he also gives us a direction because we need some direction in our lives. If we're going to have a daring confidence, then we need some direction to do what is best, to do the right thing. What is the right thing? Well, look. What took place after the resurrection, after he rose again, according to the scriptures, he was seen and there are witnesses. Witnesses who testified of what they had seen and experienced. I love how John says it in his uh, beginning of his letter. He says, we are testifying of what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, what we have handled. They were not just casual at a distance, oh, it might have been him kind of witnesses. No, they were up close and personal breaking all social distancing rules because they needed to know for sure. You remember how he told it to Thomas? Stick your finger in the holes in my hand. Do you want to see the hole in my side, Thomas? And put your hand there that you might believe. These were to be the undeniable witnesses of what they had seen. And that was his great commission to them. You shall be witnesses. So I ask you, what have we learned and experienced of God? Because that is what we are called to give testimony of. We're not all preachers. Some of you may think I'm not much of a preacher. But we are all witnesses of what God has done in our lives. A belief based on solid testimony. Because that's the one thing that you can argue about things from the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. You can argue about things in, uh, in science or politics or whatever, but there's one thing that's very hard to argue about, and that is eyewitness testimony. Because it's yours. And you know what you saw. The better you know what you saw and experienced, then the better that testimony is. What about our relationship with God? What about our relationship with Christ? Have we handled, have we tasted and seen that God is good? Our life of faith should be interacting with the acts of the Holy Spirit working through us, in us, and for us. And so we are given direction to give a testimony of words and actions of grace and compassion to those around us. We should stand out as a people who have hope. Peter says people should be asking the reason for the hope that lies within you. We're not to be the ones that are, you know, acting irrational in these times of crisis. We're the ones to have a position of strength upon which we stand, a confidence in Christ. 
so we can give knowing that our Father is the good provider. We can care for others knowing our Father cares for them already. We can pray knowing that our Father answers according to our asking. He wants us to ask so that He can answer. And we can abound knowing that what we're doing is not in vain in the Lord. And so we have a direction. And so He says, Go, love as I have loved you. What would love require of me? And from that direction, we have a determined hope. A determined hope. I love this. Because we have a hope. And you look here a little farther down in 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to look there in verses 24 through 26, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son Himself will also be subject to Him who put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. I don't want us to get lost in some of Paul's uh, explanation there. He knew his people; some of his people were going to struggle with uh, with some of the uh, Trinity concepts that he was putting in there. But he's, I want you to grasp that verse 26. <coughs> the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. All enemies defeated. Sin, he lived the sinless life. The devil was defeated numerous instances and climaxed at the cross. Perfectly fulfilling the will of the Father. Death, there's an empty grave. And in a few weeks we're going to celebrate the resurrection. In fact, we kind of celebrate it every time we gather on a Sunday. We have a hope in a Savior who has defeated every one of his enemies. And those enemies are ours. Because is that not what's at the root of what a lot of people are fearing in these days? Is death. What is on the other side? And he says, look. Our Savior has given us a determined hope. If all of our hope was only in this life, we would be people most pitied, especially as believers. But no, our hope is way beyond what is in this life. It is in Christ, where God is all in all. I love that. All right, let's keep moving here. we got a lot of ground to cover. I want to jump all the way down to verses 42 and 45. Because Paul is, is walking them through and dealing with some questions that they were dealing with. But we're not going to deal with those today because we're looking for where our hope is. We're also looking for where our destination is. We have a destination and our destination, glory. Love that word. Destination in glory. Verses 42 and 45. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So he says, in this resurrection of the dead, we they may stick us in the ground, and that old body, it needed stuck in the ground. From dust we were made, to dust we shall return. But that corruptible body will be raised in incorruption. No more sin nature. No more curse. No more of that nasty decay and that bent towards sin and the things that are bad, bad for us. That's the 
thing about humanity that drives us crazy about ourselves and others especially is when we're so self-destructive so self-destructive but no more raised to incorruption we've been sown in dishonor raised in glory no more of the embarrassment no more of the regrets raised to victory Jesus paid it all and all that penalty all that death is paid for and we're given glory instead sown in weakness raised in power no more sickness no more susceptibility to all the things that are trying to kill us in this world no more just falling apart bodies no more failings raised to power it is sown a natural body but raised a spiritual body freed from the very presence of sin and the things that bind us to this world we can't even conceive of what is ahead God says you just can't wrap your brain around it we're given a hint of it as we see the resurrected Jesus interact with the disciples in those 40 days because he's no longer just a living being God breathed into Adam and made him a living being Christ is now the life giving spirit the last Adam Christ is the life giving spirit he's not a recipient he's a giver he gives us life and anchored in this discussion of contrast between what we are and what we will be is the realization that we must be changed to be made suitable for heaven we need to be changed and so look down there at verses uh, 51 behold I tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed this isn't what we were made for we have to be remade it's why Jesus told Nicodemus you must be born again the start of the new creation is then when we trust in Christ the first time put our confidence in him because we're no longer satisfied with this world and we want him we're no longer trying to make it on our own in our own strength and our own righteousness we look to him as a beggar with nothing else he saves us and the new creation begins then in us and he's going to finish it one day finish it oh, even so Lord. raised incorruptible incorruptible so what was raised what was sown corruptible is raised in incorruption but you notice the power of the word it's even better still incorruptible can't even be touched with corruption and immortal for this corruptible must put on incorruption this mortal must put on immortality then then will come to pass the same death is swallowed up in victory you see how he's starting to bring this to to a climax here because now we have one last thing and that is we have a delight because in glory is our true delight our delight death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your sting Oh hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is our shout of victory, our joy. Therefore, brothers and sisters, beloved, be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We can love recklessly. We can care generously. We can give and do and 
sacrifice because whatever we give of this world is going away anyways and is worthless compared to what we have in Christ, a loving God who loves us and cares for us. And so Paul has walked us here in 1 Corinthians 15 step by step so that we might see that we have, even if we need reminded, hope in the resurrection. Because ours is going to have a resurrection like His. And so it gives us a daring confidence and a direction to give testimony and a determined hope that this world is not all there is, but we have a destination in glory and that should be our delight both then but especially now in these challenging times. And so there's not going to be a song. There's not going to be an invitation. Because the invitation is where you are now. That we ponder on these things, not just quickly go on to something else, but that we pause and rehearse in our minds what God has taught us here through his word, through the testimony of the Apostle Paul, an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord, and that he was changed, dramatically so. And he says, you should be too. And the more he thought on the resurrection, the more radical his life was changed. And the happier he was, the more joy he had in spite of circumstances because he knew where his delight was. His victory was in Christ. And there was nothing this world could do to separate him from the love of God. And there was nothing in this world that could separate him from his love for God. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we thank you we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who is the seal and guarantee of what you are doing in us. That we may have a confidence, Lord, that what you've begun in us, you will complete in us. And oh, the work of completion that is ahead yet, Lord. So help us to be steadfast and abounding, immovable Lord in you. Help us to love and to care for those around us because you care and love for them. Because you care and love each of us. Don't let us listen to the lies. Forgive us of the times that we, we fail and doubt and listen to those lies and act on them. We pray, Lord, these things in the name and for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. God bless. Be safe out there and continue on.